president, welcome to the Father's house. Let's jump to our feet. It's time to worship our great God, and he is worthy of our praise. So let's declare his goodness and his greatness this morning. Come, let us worship our King. Come, let us bow at his feet. He has done great things. what our Savior has done. See how His love overcomes. He has done great things. He has done great things. Oh, hero of heaven, you conquer the grave. You free every captive. You break every chain. Oh, God, you have done just doesn't do great things. He is great. Amen. Amen. Well, this morning, we want to teach you a brand new song. And, you know, it's the first Sunday of the month, and we get to receive communion today. And we don't ever want it to be like a something that is rote, something that is robotic, right? We don't just want to come in here and, well, this is just what we do on the first Sunday of the month. We, we take this little piece of wafer, and we take this juice, and and uh, we say a little prayer, and then we say amen. And for those of you that are joining us online, you can go ahead and get your elements ready as well while we're singing this song. You can get whatever you have in your kitchen. It doesn't matter what it is. We just want you to be a part of what we're doing here today. But we want to remind ourselves of who our God is, of who Jesus is, and what he has done for us. We don't always just want to rush into this and just rush out, again, making it rote and robotic. But we really want to sit in this moment and really want to remind ourselves, what has Jesus truly done for me? You may have come into this place today not feeling it, and that's okay. 
There's times when I come up here and I don't feel it either. But let's remind ourselves, even in the midst of our own emotions and our own feelings, remind ourselves of who Jesus is and how great he just really is. It's the mystery of this hope in me. How you hold the stars, yet you hold my heart. One who's first and last wiped away my past. Perfect royalty made his home in me. To the one who holds the stars, we lift you higher, we lift you higher. To the one who holds my heart, there is no other, there is no other. If you want to go ahead and have a seat this morning, um, my name is Lisa Humphreys, and I am in the School of Ministry here at the Father's House, and um, it is my privilege to share this time with you today. <clears throat> One of my favorite things that we get to do in worship is to celebrate communion together, a believer's meal. If you came in and didn't get your elements, if you want to raise a hand, our ushers will be happy to bring those to you. Like Pastor Andrea said, if you're online, um, grab whatever you have. It's just a symbol. If it's coffee and a bagel or chips and a soda, just grab that and have that ready. I have a question for you today. Who remembers set it and forget it? I heard some chuckles, right? Set it and forget it. That's really good for cooking some chicken. But that's all wrong for what we want to do today. We want to set it in our hearts, and we want to remember it. We want to set it and not forget what we get to do today. We're going to put in our minds and our hearts and our souls forever to remember what Jesus did for me and for you when he went to that cross. And that's what we get to celebrate today. On a Wednesday evening at our encounter service, if you were here, if you weren't, make sure that you come next month. It's the first Wednesday of every month. Pastor Andrea said to us when we finished up, she said, don't forget what you felt in this place tonight. And so that's what I would say to you. Don't forget what you're about to experience and what you're about to remember as we celebrate communion today. We're all about a next step here at the Father's House. So I'd ask you, what are you going to do this week 
in the next step so that you can remember what you just experienced here with us as we worship together, as we celebrate a communion. Maybe you're going to put a graphic on your uh, screensaver on your phone for this week that reminds you of what you did. Maybe you're going to buy a bottle of grape juice and sit it on the counter and look at it for the week. For me, I have a picture that hangs in our dining room. We've been married 35 plus years, and that picture has always hung in the dining room that is a reminder of the Passover supper that Jesus celebrated with the disciples. And there are some days when I just need to stop and look at that picture, and I need to just remember what he did for me. We're going to read out of um, Mark today. We're staying in Mark as we are in this series. So I'm going to read to you um, Mark 14, 22 through 24 out of the Passion Translation. So if you want to get your bread, as they were dining, Jesus took the bread and blessed it. And he said to the disciples, receive this. It is my body. Then taking the cup of wine and giving thanks to the Father, he declared the new covenant with them. And as each one drank from the cup, he said to them, this is my blood, which seals the new covenant poured out for many. So as we continue today, set this moment, don't forget it. And let's remember every day what Jesus did for us.
Jesus Christ, a perfect sacrifice. You are beautiful, and our hope's in you alone. Your
His name is Jesus, light of the world. There's freedom in His name, awesome in power, reigning forever, light of the world. There's freedom in His name. If you feel name. comfortable, just raise your hands and sing. His name is Jesus. His name is Jesus, light of the world. There's freedom in His name, awesome in power, reigning forever. Light of the world, there's freedom in His name. Come on, say it again. His name is Jesus. Come on, we surrender under the weight of His your glory, God. His name is Jesus, light of the world. There's freedom in His name, awesome in power, reigning forever. this morning why don't you turn around to a few of your neighbors and welcome them today tell them they look great today Good morning, good morning, and welcome again. For those of you that don't know me, my name is Andrea. I'm the worship pastor here, and I'm so excited that you guys are, man, you guys are excited to be here too. Man, what's just a, a excited fest. I couldn't think of the word I wanted to say, but you, you, you get me, you feel me, right? Well, if today is your first day here at the Father's House, we're so excited that you are here, just, you know, again, carrying on the excited fest, that, um, but we are so honored that you would come to the Father's House here today, and we would like to get a little bit of information from you, if you feel comfortable, in the seat back in front of you is a connection card, and if you could just pull that out, again, put as much information on there as you feel comfortable, and you're going to hold on to your connection card till the very end of the service, and when you leave today out these back doors, you're you're going to take your card to the new here start here table because we have a gift that we want to give to you and it's just for you coming today just so so we can say we honor you and we thank you for coming to the father's house today the rest of us we're going to pull out that connection card too because what do we do around here what are we what are, what are we so big about on, around here Next steps, you are right. See, it's not just enough to just listen to God's word. It's not just enough to read God's word, but we have to apply the word to our life. And one of the ways that we do that around here, this is the culture of the Father's house. We take next steps. We are a people who take next steps and we apply God's word to our, 
word to our life because we understand that no change will ever happen if we don't apply the word to our life. So we're going to hold on to our connection cards and we're going to wait till the very end after we've heard the word and so that we can take a moment to respond and take a next step, whatever Holy Spirit is saying to us today. And we're going to write it on that connection card and then turn it in on, in one of the buckets. There will be buckets at every single exit when you exit today. So make sure that you do that. Uh, here at TFH, we do feel that it's it's important for us to, to, to stay connected. A lot of S's and, and T's in there. So um, we want to make sure that we all fill out a connection card because you may have a prayer request. You may have a, a praise report. We want to hear those things. We want to pray with you, and we want to celebrate with you. So make sure that you're filling those out weekly. We've got a lot of stuff going on around here. One of the things I want to mention is the shoe drive. Lila and Richard here on the front row, they have a ministry that last year it was 8,000 pairs of shoes, correct, that they sent over to Haiti and and five women were 16 women. Sorry, that's that's wrong. That we need to change that. 16, listen to me. You got to be a part of 16 women in Haiti starting their own business. How amazing is that? That's because you're a generous, a generous congregation, and I love it. I love it. So make sure that you're bringing in your brand new, gently used, and I say gently, more on the side of new. Don't, don't bring in your 10-year-old shoes. We don't want to do that. We want to give excellence. Our God is an excellent God, and we should operate in excellence. So let's bring in those brand new shoes. All month of February, you have a chance. So if you didn't bring them in today, that's okay. It's just the start of the month. So you have three more Sundays that you can bring those in. Let's, I, I, I want them to exceed their goal this year. So let's make sure that we do that. Also, Leesburg Elementary School, our school that we've adopted that's next door here, on March 11th, we're going to do a another cleanup day. Uh, because we've adopted that school, we try and do anything and everything that we can to support them and to help them. And this is just one of the ways. So if you're interested in helping out on that day, maybe you're off that day and you say, hey, I could go and do that. I could go help clean and make that campus look great and look excellent. You can text the word school to that number on the screen, or you can take out that connection card and you can write on the back, say, LES cleanup, um, and then someone will get in contact with you. Uh, another great thing about the LES cleanup is that the teachers are actually going to be on campus that day. So we have an extra opportunity that we get to love on those teachers over there. How many of you know in the last couple of years, we've all been going through a lot of stuff, right? Those teachers have been going through a lot of stuff over the last couple of years. So anytime that we have the opportunity that we get to love on them, let's jump on that. One more thing that I want to talk about, which actually growth track because it, uh, it happened at 10 30 remember because we we did growth track 3.0 we kind of vamped it and um today is the first sunday obviously and you have to take it in order so i, I wanted to go ahead and mention it today so that if you've never taken growth track that you already have it in your mind oh i need to put that on my calendar for next month because you want to start on the very first sunday and it will take you four sundays to go through and i promise you that you won't be upset that you did because you're going to find out how you can connect with this church, you can, you're going to find out how God wired you, how God made you, and how you can make a difference with your life. So make sure that you write that down maybe um, on, your, on your notes today or, or on your calendar or somewhere to make sure that you get um, into growth. You don't have to sign up, but you do have to show up. So make sure that we're doing that. Our ushers are coming uh, because we love to give around here. I already talked about it earlier with the shoes last year. This is such a generous people here at the Father's House. And I'm so blessed that I get to be a part of this of this body of Christ called the Father's House because you guys are just so generous. You just you love with big, huge hearts, and I love that about you. And um, uh, one of the things that I wanted to talk about before we, we pass the buckets and we receive the tithe and the offering, remember tithe is 10% it's what God has commanded of us that we return back to him the 10% of our increase and then offering is what we give above and beyond what God has maybe tugged on our heart heartstrings of something that um, a just cause maybe that we want to give to those those types of things one of the things that we were able to do as a church this past week because you are so generous is we were able to send two thousand dollars to the Ukraine for humanitarian support that's huge that's huge. And you, each and every one of you that give so faithfully, 
you get to be a part of that. I know $2,000 in comparison to, to countries and wars doesn't sound like a lot, but I can tell you that every single penny makes a difference and every single penny latched onto the penny next to you and so on and so forth locally and nationally and worldwide. It is making and will make a difference because God is going to take what we give out of a generous heart and he's going to multiply it all for his glory, right? Well, since we're talking about the Ukraine, would you mind if we just took just a moment and prayed for them? Father, we, um, we come before you with humble hearts this morning, uh, humble that we're able to come to a place where there is no fear, where we have a comfortable seat, where we have air conditioning. Father, there's no fear that anyone is going to come in and break up this meeting today. But our brothers and sisters around the world, especially in Ukraine, cannot say that today. So, Father, we, we lay them before you. We, we stand in the gap for them that maybe those that cannot stand can't even kneel right now because of what they're facing, God. We stand in the gap for them, and we fight in the, in the spiritual battle on behalf of them today, God. We ask that you would protect them continually like we know you already have and will continue to do. We, we will declare Psalm 91 over them, that you are the God who protects. You are the God who, who his people can come up underneath your wings and that they will be completely 100% safe in you, God. We right now take authority in the spirit, not in our own authority, but in the authority of Jesus Christ in his name, the name that is above every name. And we say, enemy, you can go no further. Right now, in the name of Jesus, we push the enemy back. Your kingdom come and your will be done in the life of our brothers and sisters in the Ukraine, God. We thank you that you are working on behalf of them. Father, I just pray right now, even as we are praying, that those that have lost hope in the midst of the fight, God, that you would remind them that you are a strong anchor that they can hold on to that will never fail them. And we just thank you for it in Jesus' mighty name. And all of God's people said, Amen. Ushers, you can pass the buckets and watch this video. I just don't trust you. You don't trust me? No, I mean, I want to trust you. I just don't. <laughs> I have an exercise that I think will really help you. Oh, okay. Stand here and face this direction. Mm -hmm. Now, do you trust me? Uh, no, I just said I don't trust you. Right. Well, this is all part of the exercise. Oh, all right. right. Okay. Whenever I ask you if you trust me, you say, yes, Jesus, I trust you. Even though I don't. It's practice. Okay. So, do you trust me? <laughs> yes, Jesus. I trust you. Now, fall back. Are you going to catch me? Don't worry about that part. Okay, that's the part I'm worried about. <laughs> you can do this, okay? Just trust me. Trust you. Fall back. Okay, well, Jesus, I trust Good. you. Yes, I do trust you. I'm going to fall okay. back. Woo! Oh, okay. <laughs> Great. Uh, okay. Let's try this again. Just face this direction and keep your feet planted, okay. all right? Do you trust me? Yes, Jesus, I trust you. Now, fall back. Okay, I'm going to do it. All right. I'm really going to do it. <laughs> okay. Good. Ah! Oh, Jesus, you really caught yeah. me. I didn't think you were going to catch me, but you did. Oh, that was great. Nice. That was great. You're ready for level two. Level two, here yes. I come, baby. Woo! No. Whoa. <laughs> okay, hold it. <laughs> oh, you know what? You're too close. You need to move back. <laughs> ah, right. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> This one's a little bit different, Laura. Oh, okay. Uh, stand here. Uh-huh. But face me. Woo! Forward fall. Okay. I can do that. Wait. <laughs> Whoa. Okay. Um, wait for my signal. Oh, right. The Jesus signal. <laughs> yes. The okay. Jesus signal. Do you trust me? Yes, Jesus. I trust you so much. Good. Fall back. <laughs> That's awesome. It is awesome. <laughs> Especially when you do it. <laughs> Seriously? Of course. Okay, Jesus... I don't know if you noticed this, but there is nobody over there. I know it looks that way to you. It looks that way. It is that way. 
You can do this, Laura. Just trust me and fall back. Jesus, I can't do that. We can do it together. I can't. You can. I won't. Wow. You sure got quiet in here at the end. Does that young lady remind you of anyone you might know? No? No. I love that. Right off the bat. No. I mean, my neighbor, maybe a friend, uh, somebody you work with, maybe a family member, maybe somebody you see every day in the mirror. Hmm? I think we've all been there at one time or another. I really like the, the, the simple fact that she, she went to Jesus because she believed in him. She went to him, and she was honest with him. Most of us, most of us, we, we believe in him, and, but our honesty level is sometimes clouded over with, I trust you, Lord. Well, sometimes I, I don't. Anybody here ever find themselves in a place where you're not really, some, you've just been in places where you look back and you weren't sure if Jesus was back there? Okay, since you're not going to raise your hands on that, how many here are lying about that? My name is Ben. I'm one of the pastors here on staff. My responsibility is the men's ministry and the safety ministry. And uh, I love working here. And I am here uh, because Pastor Terry and Pastor Anita are gone. They've, they've gone out and they asked me if I would come and, and share. And uh, I'd just like you to, to know that if you haven't seen the entire series, if you've missed any part of it, I'd really encourage you to go to the internet, boot it up, and check it out, because it's, it's worth seeing. It really is good. You know, <clears throat> one Christmas, the children, you know how the children always do a little something during Christmas? The children had come up, and they were on the platform, and it filled the stage, and there were little ones, I mean little tiny fellas, and, and, and children up to the age of 10 or 12 years old, and they had all lined up there, and they started singing Christmas carols. They sang Silent Night. They sang a whole bunch of different stuff. And it was really good. And, of course, they got a standing ovation, which really lit their fire, right? Of course, you got to stand up and applaud your own, right? Come on, how many grandparents know that is a law, right? Well, they got all excited. Well, the pastor went over and picked up this little guy and held on to him, and he said, whose birthday are we celebrating? The little fella looked around and said, Jesus! Of course, he got more of a pause. He got all excited about that. He said, really? He said, uh, where does Jesus live? The pastor asked him. And he put his hand on his chest, and he goes, he lives in my heart. Wow. And of course, the pastor wanted to give the kudos to, to mom and dad or, or the Sunday school teacher. And so he asked, and how do you know that? And he sat there for a moment, and he kind of looked around, and then he looked down. Then he lifted his head, and he said, because I can feel him walking around in there. <laughs> Guys, if you ever find yourself at a place to where you're just not sure where Jesus is, that maybe it looks like, you know, there's nothing behind you, or maybe you're just wondering, is God really as close as I, I need him to be? Just put your hand in your heart and hear him walking around in there. You can feel him walking around in there. Go ahead and do that real quick. Just do that. Now, I don't know about you, but I've got enough foliage between my heart and my chest right now. I don't know. I can't feel him. But I know he's in there. That is something that I want you to walk away with today. If you walk away with anything, I want you to know God is closer than you think. He is closer than you think. And you know what I just noticed? I didn't notice it in the first service, but I was sitting here, and, and we were worshiping, and I happened to look up, and I saw Jesus, and I thought, he's got my back this morning. I got him right there, and he's lit up. I hope your Jesus is lit up. Mine is. We're going to look at a, at a next chapter in the book of Mark, chapter 6. If you have your Bibles, open them up to that. And uh, we're going to go through this. And what I want to talk to you about is I want to talk to you about a group of folks who don't realize that God is closer than you think. Now, chapter 6... When I read through chapter 6, I found that there was a lot of fodder there for a good message. But I got hung up on verses 1 to 6 because for some reason, 
I have read that. Don't, don't read it. We'll get into it in just a moment. But I have read that many times. I've heard it preached and talked about, but I've never actually heard a sermon on it. And I've never really studied it out. So to me, it was just a, a simple statement that was that, uh, of something that happened when Jesus went home. But then I started getting into it. And I realized, you know, things are a little different than what we perceive. Look at verses 1 and 2. Jesus left there and went to his hometown, accompanied by his disciples. When the Sabbath came, he began to teach in the synagogue. And many who heard him were amazed. Where did this man get these things, they asked. What is, what is this wisdom, or what's this wisdom that has been given to him? What are these remarkable miracles he is performing? Uh, let, let's begin at, at the top first, couple, two or three words. It says, from there, right? In other words, he came from some place. Where did he come from? Well, he came from chapter 5. <laughs> what chapter are you in this week? He came from chapter 5. Chapter 5, our pastor shared with us a marvelous message last week. And again, let me encourage you to go back and see it if you haven't seen it or listen to it as well. But he spoke about chapter 5 and, and what took place. And this is where Jesus came to go home. Now, what happened in chapter 5 is pretty amazing. He had what I would consider probably the single most powerful evangelistic tours ever. Because in chapter 5, just before he goes home, four marvelous and incredible things took place in rapid succession. First, he calmed a storm. Now, I've never done that. Anybody here calm a storm? Pretty, pretty impressive. Secondly, he cast demons out of a possessed man. I've seen that happen. Thirdly, he healed a woman with an incurable disease. And fourth, he raised a little girl from the dead and returned her to her father. Now, that is bam, 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 just like that in chapter 5. And then what does he do? Oh, let's go home. Now, how many of you have ever done anything and were really successful at it and you didn't want to stop because it was working? Right? Right? What celebrity or musician or anybody else would be on tour and find that they, they are in the number one top ten charts? Man, they are rocking. The stadiums are full. And suddenly the manager says, hey, let's go home. <laughs> are you kidding me? We're on a roll here. We don't want to go home now. And what does Jesus do? He does everything from calm to storm to raising the dead. And he said, let's go home. I can imagine the other 12 are going, are you kidding we don't want to go home now. Look at the crowds that are gathering. I mean, your celebrity status is through the roof. You are one of the most popular rabbis that have ever walked in the last generation, if not more. We're not going to go home. Let's hang in there. Let's let this grow a little bit. Let's, let's really... No, Jesus said. And I'm hypothecating because we're not... It isn't written in Scripture, but I don't think it's a, a stretch to assume that Jesus then looked at the 12 and said, uh-huh, I heard you. Good. Let's go home. And he went home. Because there's something special about going home, isn't there? Anybody, has anybody here ever been? And I ask you a lot of questions and raising your hands and stuff. And, and you're welcome to shout out, too. I don't really count. I may not answer you because I'm old and I can't hear well. But, but anyway, that, that's not really true, Pastor Tim. How many here have ever been on an extended leave away from home? You've gone somewhere for a long, longer period of time, months, maybe even years. Yeah? Did you then go home? Yeah. Wasn't that a great feeling to go home? I mean, there's, it just going home feels good. And Jesus has been gone now over a year. And he's going home. And there's, just, there's this anticipation. I remember, I remember when I was away from home for an extended period of time. And we used to call it when you were getting ready to go home, you were a short timer back in those days. And when you were a short-timer, all you could think about is what it was going to be like. Now, you, you knew you weren't going to go home and you were going to get a ticker tape parade. You knew that wasn't going to happen. But you knew that you were going to re be received and accepted because you were home. And you know what's nice about being home? Is you can be yourself. 
You can be yourself because whoever's there with you knows you. They've been, they know who you are. They know every crack and chink in your armor. They know. So you don't have to be something else. You don't have to be whatever it was you were when you were gone. Now when you're back, you can kick back and you can just be you. You can let your room become a mess. Right? And Jesus is going home. I, I, I saw, in fact, just the other day, I was going uh, along and on this house, you might may have seen this, the yard uh, was filled with signs. The garage had a huge banner on it. Trees had yellow ribbons on it. There were balloons on just about everything. And a big sign on the banner said, welcome home. Have you ever seen those? Now, I don't know. Anybody ever do that? That's pretty cool. I don't, I, I don't know who they were welcoming home. I've, I've seen them also where they were welcoming home, welcoming home a little baby that has never even been in that house before. But now they're home. The coming home is really cool. And Jesus, Jesus was going home. It says, when the Sabbath came, he began to teach in the synagogue. And many who heard him were amazed. Now that word amazed, we're going to hear again. And I'll talk about that in just a moment. But I've always kind of pictured what took place in this scenario. That Jesus, being Jesus, right? You know, that that charge on, I'm here to save the world, guy that really can stand up against anything. I kind of always pictured him as walking in to the synagogue on the Sabbath, picking up a scroll, stepping up on the platform, and starting to tell these people the truth that they needed to hear. Why did he get up there? Because he was Jesus, right? I went and started looking into this a little bit and realized that that isn't necessarily the way it went down. Jesus didn't just walk in, pick, some, pick up a scroll, and begin to preach what he wanted to share with people. He was invited to take that podium. And he was invited because the elder priest or the chief rabbi would be responsible always to determine who would speak from that pulpit to those people. He was invited. Why was he invited? Because he was one popular rabbi. And popularity is what usually determined who would be speaking on the Sabbath that particular day, right? And Jesus comes home. He's got crowds following him, miracles following him. You can hear what they just said. He says, wow, what miracles are these? And what wisdom is this? He came home, and the first thing the rabbi wanted to do is, son, we want you talking. But it's interesting that What he had to say and who he was was not expected. I think that's pretty evident just by the way it's read. It wasn't expected because notice what he says. Who is this guy? Where did he get this? What about these miracles that I've seen and and, and I've heard? This, This is not, who is he? Obviously, they weren't expecting him to actually Come up and take that podium and make a difference. Why? Well, he only left a year or so earlier, not even, not much more than a year. And these were hometown folks. They knew him pretty good. We got to, let's picture what actually is transpiring here because sometimes when we read the Bible, we tend to think that things like this took place in a bubble. Everybody was awed and amazed by Jesus' presence and he came into the room and everything got silent and Jesus skipped. No, no, no. It was a world not unlike our own, with the same problems, same difficulties, and same rejections. Everybody's judging somebody. Okay? He walks in, and he says, and he says, what did this man get? Where did he get these things? What is this wisdom that has been given to him? What are these remarkable miracles? Well, in verse 3, check that out real quick. It says, isn't this the carpenter? Isn't this Mary's son and the brother of James, Joseph, Judas, and Simon? Aren't aren't his sisters here with us also? And what happened? They what? Took offense at him. Oh, wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute. On one hand, they're sitting there talking about the marvelous, marvelous miracles that he does, the wisdom that he has, and then in the next sentence, they're offended. Which, by the way, if they lived today, would be right in, because just about everybody is. Right? How many here have been offended this morning? 
Yep, the morning's young. Hang in there. Here I come. That, that, that's just... What were they offended by? The marvelous words of wisdom, which they recognized because they said it. Were they, were they offended by the miracles that they either seen or heard? Maybe they were offended by his godly presence. I mean, that certainly has offended a lot of people. It offended people so much they crucified him. What was it, though, that actually offended these people? I don't believe it was any of those things. I don't believe it had anything to do with what he said or did. I don't believe it had anything to do with the, the history that he had and the reputation that he was receiving or the, or, or the marvelous crowds that gathered around just to listen to what he had to say. He had groupies with more people than they had in Nazareth. What was it? I think it was what they knew and what they thought they knew. You see, that's the way we judge things, you know that? That's the way we determine whether or not there's anybody behind us. By what we know and what we think we know. That little girl said, there's nobody back there. And he said, that's okay. Don't worry about it. But you don't understand, right? I can see with my own eyes. There's nobody back there. I can feel. I'm, I'm pretty sure that I'm confident I'm going to hit the deck if I, back, if I fall back. Jesus said, but you got to trust me. you got to know that I am closer than you think. You know? Ah, that's kind of hard to do sometimes because we have a tendency to think of God in this celestial spot called heaven, which is just over there somewhere. But he's got good eyes because he's watching us, but he's up there someplace. No, he's right here, right now. Not sure? Oh, yeah, there he is. If you're not sure periodically throughout the service, check it out. And if you can't feel a thing, let our medical team know. <laughs> let me talk to you about what I think they knew. Take note of what it says right there. Who is this guy? Isn't he the carpenter? carpenter? Now, this may not sound like a bad profession, because today we see those trades as being incredibly valuable and good. But in the day of Christ, a carpenter was just one step above a sheep herder or a shepherd, and a shepherd was considered the lowest profession you could have. So carpentry wasn't all that much above that. So Here's Jesus speaking, <laughs> and I'm listening to, wow, listen to this guy. Wait a minute, wasn't, isn't he the guy that built my table in the living room over here? I, he made another table similar to that for Pete, and there's this, old, there's this chair he repaired for me. But th he's a carpenter. He's, he's just, I remember years ago, most of you in the room probably don't remember this, but I remember hearing people say, he's running for president. He's an actor. Yeah. Huh? All of a sudden, there was this, what? Wait a minute, I know him as this, and yet he's saying he wants to be, or he's going to be, this. When we fail to recognize how close God is to us, we deprive ourselves of everything that he has for us. We don't know what is available to us because we don't know that he's always present. Think of Think of how you would respond. Just imagine in your own life those things that you do that you know God would not approve of. Now imagine if you would. Now you can say, oh, not me. no, not any of you, not here at Father's house. None of you would ever do anything like that. But out there, there are people who actually still sin. <laughs> Believe me, it's a, it's a tragic thing, but it happens. Imagine, just imagine yourself at a place to where you knew what God wanted of you, you knew what you wanted to do, and you chose instead to do it because there was nobody around to see it. Oh, but put it another way. Just as you were about to do whatever that is that you do, 
Pastor Terry showed up and said, hi. Would you still do it? No. I, trust me, I know. As a pastor, I've been a pastor for a lot of years. We had a pretty good-sized church back in California. And i got to tell you, honestly, if I stop by somebody's house, the first thing I heard is an awful lot of jumping around to put stuff away. <laughs> Hi. Oh, my God, it's the pastor. No, because it's God. I am the pastor, and I was there. How is your life working out in both the good and the bad when you fail to recognize God is present? You with me? He's present. I have Jesus behind me, and you have Jesus in you. He's in you. Because he's still walking around. He says, the carpenter. Look at the next sentence. Isn't this Mary's son? Hmm. How many here read your Bible on a regular basis? Okay, how many of us of you are lying about that? <laughs> There's a group right back here started to giggle. We know who you are. No. Mary's son. You know what the way the Bible usually s expresses it when a man's name is mentioned? It's in conjunction with one of two things. Either his father's name or where he's from. Like Jesus of Nazareth. Or John and James, the sons of Zebedee. It's always in conjunction with the father's lineage. Well, you wouldn't be saying Jesus of Nazareth when you're standing in Nazareth. So what would be the appropriate response? The appropriate response would, Jesus, son of Joseph. Because that's what they knew him by. Or not. In this instance, not. Remember who we're talking about here. This is hometown folks, probably a couple of these sections have more people in them than they had in all of Nazareth. You get to know people pretty well when you live in the desert lands that closely. There were parents that were there when Jesus came home with Mary and Joseph for the first time, and this little boy grew up, and they watched him. There were men and women there that maybe Jesus played with as a child. They knew him. And you know what else they knew? They knew the backstory. They knew about this Mary because they saw Mary and Joseph get on that donkey and head to uh, Bethlehem. And what was, what was Mary? Not just a donkey rider. She was also pregnant. And it was well known by whom? <laughs> we don't know. They said God. Go figure. You know, we, we, tend to feel that, we tend to feel that Jesus didn't have any adversity as he grew up. That he just lived a good, happy life and everybody loved him because, hey, who could, who could not love Jesus, right? They had the same prejudices, the same arrogance, the same elevation of popularity and personhood and financial standing as any place else with the same attitudes. Exactly the same and probably more. Think about this. This is a boy who is birthed to a mother who should have been stoned. And they know that. Can you well imagine how many families didn't allow their children to play with that little Nazarene? What was talked about with him? What was meant to him. These are the same people that he came back to to share the truth. He went home after a successful ministry. He went home after an incredible tour to talk to people that he has known all of his life and knows him very, very well, and he went back to share with them the truth because he wanted to see those people that was, that was in his life the most, the, for the longest, he wanted to show them the truth so that they too would reside with him in eternity. I don't think they heard a word. They didn't hear a word because all they were looking at is that carpenter who's the son of Mary. They don't even mention Joseph because he's not his father. Well, who's his father? Well, I heard. Huh? And, and I only say that in love. 
That's Christianese for gossip. <laughs> I've been around a long time. I've had a lot of Christianese. Besides, think about this. The, the family, back in chapter 3, verse 21, the family, Jesus' family, actually told, professed openly, it's in the Bible, that Jesus had lost his mind. Why would they have said that? To distance themselves from this evangelist that is upsetting the world. His own family. How would you like it? Think of, think of your mother or your father or whoever in your family is really close to you that you loved and respected. Now think about that person. Put them here in your mind's eye. You got it? Now imagine them turning to, over here to Pastor Tim and looking back at you and going, I think they've lost their mind. Feel pretty good about that? That's got to hurt. That has got to hurt. And these are the same people that saw Jesus all his life, and he knows them, and they know him. That is an important part, because you know what, you know what this is? There's a statement that is being applied here, and I want you to give me the last word. Familiarity breeds... Familiarity breeds what? Contempt. Familiarity breeds contempt. And who are these people? The most familiar people around. They were judging Jesus and judging God on what they know, what they think they know, what they saw and what they think somebody else may have seen. They are judging Jesus on everything except who he is, who they allow him to be. I want you to put on Jesus' sandals for a minute. And I want you to just stand there and imagine that you're looking at your family. Picture your own family in front of you. And you want desperately to share the truth and the gospel with them. And all of a sudden, Jesus stops and he says this. But I, before we get in, I want you to understand, this is not a statement. This is a profession of heart. And Jesus said to them, a prophet is not without honor. Hold up. A prophet is one who is proclaiming, and he is proclaiming, right? He was invited to proclaim, and he stood and he proclaimed the truth. And he's telling us a prophet is always received with honor. A prophet is honored by everyone because of who he is and what he's doing, and they deserve and receive honor. And he says a prophet is not without honor. But then listen to his heart. Except in his own town, among his own relatives, and even in his own home. See, that's not a statement of, hey, there's cars in the parking lot, go ahead and drive one. No. He is making a comment from his heart that he is, his heart is broken because those who he loves the most, even in his own home, will not receive what he has said and what he's done because familiarity bred contempt. And contempt is disrespect, dishonoring, judgmental. It's lifting oneself above another and looking down upon them. Find them not to be worthy. That is the definition of contempt. So what did they reject? Well, it wasn't what he did. They were rejecting him. They rejected him. They weren't re rejecting his message. They weren't rejecting his miracles. They were rejecting him. And you see it even today. Every day, there's this continuous, constant rejection. I, I got to tell you, I, I looked it up, and this was interesting. There's studies done almost every year, well, every year, and it's been done since the 40s. And these studies determine different things that American, the American population uh, deal with, uh, what, they're, what they're planning. You know, it's just a way of, of checking for businesses as to who's into this or who's into that. And one of the things that I always like looking up is what does the individual American citizen fear most? What do you fear most? 
every year from the 40s up until 2017, there was one position held sway against everything else, even over death. See, most of us aren't afraid of death. It's the dying part we don't like, right? But that, this one thing has always held sway up until 2017. And you know what that is? Public speaking. <laughs> Go figure. And I know it's true because at the moment I'm terrified. Public speaking is the number one thing that American individual citizens fear most. I, I just find that interesting, especially the fact that it isn't number one anymore. In 2017, it dropped down to two, and it's about to drop down to three. Death, by the way, is five. <laughs> Believe it or not, there are four things that you hate or fear more except death. But the first one now is the fear of rejection. The fear of rejection has bounced public speaking out. The American people, individuals, the people in this room fear being rejected more than anything else. Now, that's not to say it applies to everybody, but it does apply to most of us. The second one is the fear of being judged. And that one's coming up strong and they expect in the next year or two, it'll knock the fear of public speaking right out of the slot. Being judged and being rejected. And what do we see happens here with Jesus? He's judged and he's rejected. You will not find anything in our owner's manual, anything in which Jesus did not do that he expects you to do or experience. There's not a single thing that you will not experience that Jesus himself did not also experience, including rejection, including being judged including coming home and finding your family not accepting you. We, I don't know, this popped in my head. Years ago, when we first, my brother and I first gave our heart to the Lord, and our wives walked with God as well. That very first year, we were all juiced for Jesus, you know, just like that little girl when she, that very first, oh, she was all excited, yeah, I trust you. We were there, right? Remember those days? How many remember walking off the ground about that far because you accepted Christ? And, <gasps> and what happened? Well, it's been a while. No, it's... You still got that option. You can still walk that way. Well, we went over to the family pic uh, not picnic, but uh, Thanksgiving, wasn't it? We went to this Thanksgiving dinner, and we were invited there. And I was sitting down with my brother. The whole family was there, a lot of people. And then in the dining room, they had this huge table set up. And then, of course, you had the, the uh, uh, coffee table with a few uh, folding chairs for the children, right, in another room. Anybody know how that works? You know who that table was for? Roberta and I and my brother and his wife. Oh, we weren't rejected because we were being fed, but you're, you're kind of getting that religious thing. So you sit over there. You remember that? It was in a different room. Oh, it was a different room, yeah. The whole, yeah. yeah. Anybody ever had that experience? When you gave your heart to Christ and started sharing that truth of Jesus Christ to somebody else, I, wanted, I want you to know, I, really, I ask you, if anybody, if you have never experienced that because of your faith in Christ, then you are doing something wrong. You should be the same offense that he was to his own hometown. Now, don't get me wrong. I'm not telling you to go tick people off just intentionally, but know that if you stand there in the truth, you can't help but offend the enemy. It's going to happen. You're in good company if they don't accept you as a prophet of truth. And don't expect them to give you that ticker tape parade either, but I mean, recognize that if they're not willing to at least listen, what's left? Look at verse 5 and 6. He could not do any miracles there except lay his hands on a few sick people and heal them. He was amazed at their lack of faith. There's the second time we see the word amazed. That's in the NIV, anyway. You see, the first time, it was they were surprised. That amazed, by its context, means they were surprised by what he said and how he, and how he acted to him, how his presence was. But here, God himself is amazed. But this term is not surprised. Jesus wasn't surprised. The Bible says he knew the heart of all men. You think he didn't know the people that caused him such grief in that little town for so long? 
Of course he did. Do you really think that when he told the disciples, let's go home, that everybody was going, yay, we're going home. This is going to be great. Mom's going to make a big meal. It's just going to be wonderful. All the siblings, we'll play a little football out front. <laughs> you know how it is when you get home. No, Jesus knew exactly what was going to happen when he walked through that door. Because they already were telling people that he lost his mind. How are they going to suddenly accept him? They do, but not at that point. You can find it later in the scriptures that they do. His brother James, <laughs> his brother James is the one that says that he lost his mind. His brother James is the very one that had a difficulty with him. His brother James was the one that had to take over when Jesus went out on the trip and became a preacher. And his brother James, you see him here, and the next thing you see him, he's the head of the Jerusalem church. Whew, something happened. Here we find we find that he is, Jesus is amazed at their lack of faith. And by the amazed, that term doesn't mean surprised. That term means awe, awestruck. He was awestruck and brokenhearted. Now, let me, let me show you the difference. Have you, has anybody ever seen a beautiful sunset? Sure, probably just about all of us, right? We've all seen a beautiful sunset. When you saw that sunset, did you go, whoa, did it surprise you? No. Why? Because you've seen a sunset every day of your life. This one happened to be beautiful. This one was awe-inspiring. It was an amazing, beautiful thing to see. It was awe-inspiring. Jesus is awed by their lack of faith. You know what he was awed by? The fact that they didn't believe? No, he already knew that was going to happen. What he was awed by is the simple fact that they were willing to go to such a degree to reject him. And let me tell you what that degree was. They allowed their family and their friends and their children to remain sick instead of bringing them to him. I mean, think about it. People were being healed, right? Right? And in a small community, I'll tell you what, if I laid hands on someone right here and healed them, don't you think you guys would probably get the idea that something's going on? If, if my son, and he was, but when, when my, if my son was sick and I saw a man back over here, a doctor whom I do not like and don't believe anything he's got to do or say, but I do know, because I could see it happening, that he has the remedy for my child's sickness. I would be crossing over the top of these chairs. Watch out, I'm coming through. I would grab up my baby, and we would be in, at his feet to get my son fixed. I don't care what I think about him, but I do care about what I think about them. And Jesus is amazed that these people would allow their own children, eyes that cannot see, ears that cannot hear, limbs that cannot work, he would allow that to continue. Whoever he or she may be, they are going to simply allow it to happen so that I can continue to reject you. Now, does that sound pretty amazing? You want to hear something that's even deeper than that? There are people, and maybe even some sitting here, that rejects the opportunity of eternal life because they just really don't want this Jesus thing going on in their life right now. Hey. Hey. Let's face it, you can pray for a healing, but if you get healed, <laughs> that's only temporary, guys. That's a temporal fix. You're still dying. Unless Jesus comes back, you're still going. You're still going to get sick of something, and it's going to take you home. Even if you get sick today, you could get sick again tomorrow. So Jesus healed people who simply are not still walking around. None of them live in the villages, although most of them look like it. I know, I live in the villages. <laughs> I are one. That's, that's simply the truth. I marvel at it, that they were so willing. Do you know what this Bible says? Do you know what the essence of this is? This is not the story of man's desire to be with God and to be close to God. It's not. It's the story of God's desire to be close to you. That is what is in this book. John Ortberg once said, <clears throat> yeah, he, in one of his books, he was 
talking about a time where he got on an airplane. And while he was flying, he got on this plane and he sat down. And you ever sit next to somebody who's got a computer and they just kind of, they're always kind of, you know, if you've ever been on a plane, you see that happen a lot. Well, he sat down, this gentleman was sitting next to him and he had this computer screen on. And on the screen was the screensaver and it was a little boy, about five years old. And uh, he looked over and John says, is that your son? The man said, yes, yes, that's my son. John says, for the next hour, he sat there looking at every single picture from the moment that kid was born all the way up to the f age five, every picture that dad could conceive of, doing everything from playing baseball to sleeping, right? And he heard about everything from his first steps to his first words. He heard dad going on and on and on. And he wanted to kind of say, mm, I got to take a nap. But he didn't. He sat and listened. But what he heard in his heart was that is the way Jesus looks at you. You are on his screensaver. You have, your picture is on his refrigerator. Everything you do is being put up there with little magnets because he wants to keep his eye on you. Why? Because he's already there. He's part of what's taking place in your life. Don't reject him. Don't fear that he is not close. I'm going to close with this. My brother was a lot like that young lady. Got all excited for Jesus, gave his heart to the Lord, believes in God. And was just absolutely stoked for Jesus. I mean, he, he changed a lot of lives because of his movement. But then after a season, well, he, he kind of needed to get charged again. And sure enough, there was something that took place and it drew his heart back to the Lord. And he got excited one more time and was ready to fall forward right into Jesus' arms. But then something happened and he actually fell back. But he didn't fall back into Jesus' arms. He fell back into the world. And he walked for a long time there. Oh, he still believed in God. He just didn't want to live for God. But the last couple of years, his life changed. He started reuniting with who God was and who God is in his life. And then he got sick last December, just before Christmas. He went into the hospital, and he spent six weeks there with COVID. Six weeks. We prayed with his wife that Craig, it's my brother's name, Craig would come home and be with his family because she couldn't see him or talk to him. She could get on the phone with him for very few minutes, but that was about it because he was in and out of ICU and whatnot. Well, the doctor said that he's doing better. They sent him home. For three full days... And he was home, he was comatose. And what I mean by that is he wasn't opening his eyes, he wasn't speaking, he wasn't doing anything. He was labored in his breathing. He was really struggling. Of course, we were constantly praying. And Donna, his wife, was sitting at a, in a chair at the foot of the bed because she never left his side. And she heard a little noise and looked up and Craig was looking kind of up a little, and he was looking up, just kind of looking up. And she asked him, what are you doing? He didn't answer, so she went over, and she said, what are you looking at? He didn't answer. She put, laid down next to him, put her arms around him, and said, you know, I love you. He dropped his head, turned his eyes to her, and smiled, and then looked back up again, took a deep breath, and he was gone. God was a lot closer than we thought. Because Jesus reached his hand out and took my brother home. And one day he'll take me home. And he'll take you home. But you need to know that before you go, he's already here. He's already there. Put your hand right here. He's closer than you think. Amen? Now, I'm going to ask you in a moment to accept him, not reject him. Because there is no, I'll accept him later. It's either now or never. 
See, that's the sad part. That's a really sad part about being a pastor. When you do an altar call and ask people to give their heart to Christ, you're also telling them, listen, if you don't, there's only other direction, just one. It's either up or, well, you know. I would love for that to be something else. I mean, let's go ahead and just tear that out of the Bible and not deal with that part. But unfortunately, it's there. And I live by this book, whether I like it, all of it or not. It's in here. When a judge walks into a courtroom, when a president walks into the room, when a dignitary, even a celebrity, comes in, what's the first thing that happens? Anybody know? Everybody stands to their feet. It's amazing. How many know in this room that the Lord God Almighty, the King of kings and the Lord of lords, the line of Judah, is in this room now? Then get to your feet. Oh, don't hesitate. If you don't believe it, remain seated. Stay there. No, no, no. I Really, honestly, if you're not sure about that, sit back down and make yourself comfy. Because this is for people who know that God is in this room. Amen? Amen. Is he in the room? Yeah. Father in heaven, I come before you and I lift these people that are standing before you. These are your children, Lord. Each and every one of them you created from the very dust of the earth and you put a focus and direction and guidance into their life. But Lord, we need to know, we need to have that, that deep understanding down in our knower that you are ever present with us. In the book of Hebrews, it says you will never leave us and you will never forsake us. In Matthew 28, you said you will be with us even to the very ends of the earth. Lord, help us, help us to recognize that what we have beating within us is the footsteps of Christ. And if you are here this morning and you have not given your life to the Lord, or you have and you need to return to God, or you've gotten into a place where you just aren't sure, and you just need to know. I want you to know there's not a single thing in your life that gives you right to say, tell Jesus that he doesn't have right in your life. There's no sin you've ever committed, no thing you've ever done. There's nothing buried in the closets of your home or down in the basements that you've covered up that God doesn't already know about, and he doesn't care. He cares about you, and he wants you, and he will change your life. We will not stand here and judge or tell you how your life should be, that is between you and God, and you know God, he'll tell you how, and he'll tell you what your life is to be. If you're here and you know that it's you, that you either need God, you need to renew with God, you need to know that God is closer because sometimes he seems so far away. I want to pray with you. I want you to pray this prayer with me. Lord Jesus, Heavenly Father, Holy Spirit, I come before you humbly. And I ask you to change my heart. Open my eyes and let me see and know that you are closer than I can ever hope to imagine. Let me never forget, Lord, that you are walking around inside. And I ask that in Jesus' holy name. Amen. Amen? Amen. All right. God is still here. Let's close in song and continue to worship him. to declare this truth together before we go out. There's never been a love so great. He died so we could live. Then he rose up from that grave. Name another king like this. Now all authority forever be been a love so great he died so we could live then he rose up from that grave name another king like this now all authority forever belongs to him he reigns in victory name another king like this we love you guys we hope that you have a wonderful rest of the day. Have a great week. We'll see you next Sunday at 9 or 11. 
Our prayer team is coming down front. If you need prayer for anything, make sure that you take advantage of that.